Uh, hi, everybody. Aaron, welcome um, back to our new building, Columbia, Columbia Business School. Or, do you have your, your thing on? There we go. Um, so, Aaron, I, I mean, I'm really excited that you're here. This is a really cool conference, Capital for Good. Uh, and, and, and you're coming back. You're an alum of Columbia Business School. Uh, and, and now we're here in this new campus, you know, thinking about these like, big ideas. But I want to start kind of at the beginning. Tell us how you got to where you are going to, from where these students are today to being part of Columbia Business School students and kind of what does that path look like uh, and, and any thoughts that you have along the way um, for them? Um, well, first of all, it's a huge honor to be here. And I, I cannot say enough how important my experiences here at, at Columbia were in terms of where I'm at now. Uh, a little bit about why I ended up at Columbia and a little bit about what I've done since then, and then we can talk about the rest. So originally born in Ethiopia, raised in the Middle East, grew up in LA. So from the very start, it was quite a bit of a wide spectrum of experiences to, that led to what were my passions. My passions were always at the intersection of, I would say, finance and economic development. Uh, but what really resonated for my time here was at the end of the day, uh, when we look at kind of the conflicts that were happening, the inequities that were happening globally, they somewhat landed at certain inconsistencies or breaking points between how private commerce was providing services for the average man and women and child. And so I wanted to be at the center of trying to figure those out. And I cannot think of a perfect combination between Columbia Business School and New York City. Largely anyone that was interested in those matters was gonna end up coming through the city and the school. And then I augmented it. I decided that I actually wanted to uh, top it off with international relations degree. So I actually did it as a dual degree. So I was at uh, Johns Hopkins SIS, their School of International Studies. Again, on the international studies side of things, I wanted to be in Washington, DC. Nothing negative about SEPA, which is a fantastic school, <laughs> uh, but just by virtue of just being around the, 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 the right set of stakeholders mattered. And, and my time here at Columbia was perfect because it actually challenged the different things I was thinking. I was fortunate enough um, to do a, a summer internships, a range of different things uh, where, you know, I, before I came to Columbia, I, I did SICE first in the dual degree. Uh, I did an internship at, at Deloitte and in their financial sector uh, development practice. And a question was asked of me. And that question was, uh, can you prove uh, a dollar being spent in um, foreign direct investment or essentially financial sector development would translate to making the average person better. And empirically, you can't. It's uh, amazing. Empirically, you can't largely because, you know, if you do the analysis, there's a gap between correlated and causal. Uh, but the only time that it, you can spotlight it is if there was some sort of technology change that happens through a private sector investment. And so when I came to Columbia, uh, I wanted to be a part of that private sector set of investments in commerce. So I interned at Goldman Sachs. I interned in their technology media telecom practice. And sure enough, I saw a lot of that tech transfer happening uh, in the tech in the form of knowledge of different industries, not necessarily technology specifically. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what really resonated was I actually got really hungry about understanding the companies themselves, how they worked. Yeah. And that's when I decided after completing Columbia that I would join McKinsey. Wow. That's a really, you know, every, it's like, I'm, I'm sure all students are, well, Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, and then McKinsey ended up at different companies. Now, I really, I mean, I think you're right, right? I've seen those FDI, you know, studies and, and how do you really can show empirically? It's always very difficult. Um, let me ask you one more thing there, though. You, you mentioned you were born in Ethiopia and had this very diverse background. Um, and then eventually you got, you got this interest in terms of commerce, in terms of, and then eventually, you know, trying to get into the company and, 
and try to understand how they work to kind of get to where you are. Um, you know, how much, how much did that change of interest was kind of the opportunities that you faced, the kind of life path that you got? And how much was it just ingrained or part of where you grew up or part of something, you know, your kind of earlier background, your identity, that kind of thing? How do you, how do you think about that identity versus opportunities that face you and those kind of things? Uh, it, so I'm definitely in the school of uh, nurture, uh, not okay. necessarily only nature. N yes, there's some elements of both that mm -hmm. are really, really critical, but by all means, um, having lived on three different continents before I was a tween, that mattered in terms of giving me a global perspective. Yeah, uh, It mattered in terms of you know the industries that I got a chance to work in and whether one stays at the 50,000 or 100,000 foot level, but understanding, you know, we're essentially execution always eats strategy for lunch. And I say that as an ex strategy consultant, that execution always matters. And I agree as a strategy professor. So there we go. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So it was through the multiple experiences that led me to say, wow, these, you know, the next step to solve has got to be to address essentially the, the hurdles that I saw. Okay. And that actually guided every step of my career. Today. I see. All right, that is, that is really interesting. Uh, so let me, let me kind of take from that, like sort of your experience and actually bring it back now to, to today. So today you're a Trident, you're a big asset management firm and you're sort of a star in this industry. Um, and, and I think, you know, I'm at least curious, there's, there's not a lot of kind of, you know, the, the, the representation of underrepresented minorities is kind of pretty low in asset management, you know, the number of, and I'm just curious, what do you think about that, about that fact? You know, how do you, how do you think about that? And how do you, how does that experience you should shape you every day? Well, to answer that question, let me actually share the trajectory that actually led Perfect. to asking that question. Definitely. Um, so prior to my time at Trident, there was kind of one uniform thread that essentially the provision of capital in under-resourced and essentially uh, underrepresented communities is an important thing to, uh, to focus on. So after my time at McKinsey, um, I helped one of our clients. Uh, so I joined a group of ex-McKinsey folks that were working at Dahlberg, which is a global advisors me firm. Uh, one of our clients was the UN system that was trying to solve a particular problem. And the problem was how foreign aid actually gets distributed into uh, developing economies, essentially, for the, whether it's for healthcare or agriculture or whatever is the case. When the World Bank, call it the, the UN system, anyone wants to distribute, uh, there's a difference between pledges and cash showing up. And everything is cash-based. So if you don't have the cash in hand, you can't buy whether it's seeds in the agriculture sector or uh, essentially female condoms in, in the healthcare sector to address family planning issues. That is an issue because if that thing does not arrive in time, you get a lot of unintended negative consequences. And so I sat at um, an effort to tr create a guarantee fund, essentially provide the credit enhancement that was necessary for foreign governments to borrow money in time from banks to be able to procure whatever they needed to. Essentially, this is Very what the private cool. sector does, right? Receivables Very financing. Cool. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, this pledge guarantee for health effort, uh, ran it as its CEO for about five years. And I'll tell you the disconnect between strategy mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and execution, even though we were able to mobilize quite a bit um, and the, it was first a Gates funded program, but then eventually the US government stepped in and uh, gave okay. at that time the largest ever uh, health investment that the Development Credit Authority had ever done. And so the issue was always these credit enhancements are different from what development policymakers are wanting to decide versus what financial institutions actually needed. They were written with the precept that you need to create skin in the game from the banking perspective. Yeah, Banks really, there's a difference between risk share, risk transfer and the like. And so from their own uh, financial regulators, it made it really hard for them to accept this. And so we always had to figure out ways every time we did a transaction. Now, 
I just gave you two different set of stakeholders, but they're all part of the same government system. So uh-huh. financial regulators are yeah. part of the U.S. government, uh, but also uh, development policymakers are also part of it. The, so they here had the same goal. They had the same somehow, goal, but were they just couldn't. Wow. You had a yeah, conflicting yeah. set of guidance. Okay. And so after my time, one of the reasons why I then moved to the Milken Institute was to address the policy gaps. Oh, and I so see. wrote and engaged with a range of policymakers to say, you know what, we need to fix the policy misalignment. And here are the areas where essentially international economic development is running at odds with macroprudential risk guidance that you guys are giving. And so now you will see that there are a number of stakeholders moving forward to make better alignment, whether it be the OECD or the the, the Basel Committee that provides guidance to make better um, alignment to the point that development financial policy runs in tandem with just global financial regulations. And was it just that they didn't understand that the right way to do it. They had the best intentions, but not a good understanding of the other side. I, I would say that's absolutely okay. true. Okay. Yeah. They, they did not understand what the other stakeholder across the hallway in okay. whatever. Wow. I mean, this is not just the U S it's a no, global course, issue. Yeah. So that led to my time asking the next question of the policy, but I'll tell you, once I got to the Milken Institute, probably within the first month, I was invited to a meeting at, um, at the white house, which, this is the tail end of the Obama administration. The Obama administration had asked the question around uh, how to mobilize capital for underserved domestic communities in the US. Uh, and here, sure enough, it was a focus on minority population. Uh, and in that meeting, they shared a statistic. This is 2016. In 2016, I think it was June 2016, on that day uh, that experience 69 months of consecutive job growth in the United States, but a 90% drop in access to capital for uh, African-American owned small businesses. And this is through the Small Business Administration's database. Absolutely. So, wow, like think about that, right? So you're talking about in an expanding economy, the pie is getting bigger, one of the slices is getting smaller. So that's fundamentally an issue that it tells you that there's more afoot to what's causing this problem. So while I was at the Milken Institute, raised our hand, and we launched an effort called the Partnership for Lending in Underserved Markets. I served as one of the co-chairs. We did a whole range of different things in the pilot two years, everything from policy uh, uh, lab ideas to innovative financing ideas spoke to different financial institutions, piloted an activity in Baltimore that could be scaled to particular other smaller cities, piloted an activity in LA to scale to other big cities. At the end of the exercise, there were a whole range of different recommendations, but it landed at something really interesting. And that was twofold. One, number one source of startup capital for a minority owned business is friends and family. Okay. Number two is bank credit. Yeah unless you come from a minority background. Number one is still friends and family, but we know of a 10 to one wealth differential between African-American minority and non-minorities in this country. So that makes that friends and family equity sliver really, really tiny and spread out. Number two is actually a credit card. Why? Because 70% of minority census tracts in this country do not have a single branch. Yeah. That's a highly inefficient source of capital to grow wealth, create jobs in underserved communities in this country. So solving that in terms of getting better access to credit was one of the issues. And so we spearheaded a whole bunch of different things that included essentially a a look at who's banking the underbanked, whether it is trying to figure out how do you get the, the Goldman Sachs and JP Morgans to focus on underserved communities or to find who's there, i.e. CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, yeah. designated um, entities with a 60% focus in underserved communities, both in lending and deposits, or minority depository institutions, more than 50% leadership, ownership uh, of a particular uh, minority, whether that's African-American, Hispanic, uh, Native American, or, um, uh, or Asian American. Really said, let's do both. Let's do both. And so... At that time, there wasn't a lot of focus. This is like mm-hmm. 2017, at which point yeah. 
we published quite a bit, showed the strength of what this space could potentially be if it was appropriately scaled. Because it was, we actually ran regression analysis looking at the return on assets of MDIs versus non-MDIs and proved empirically that actually within a size band, they were just as efficient. This was pretty like revolutionary at the time. And I testified in Congress at the House Financial Services Subcommittee and we shared these findings and said, look, if any intervention should be about scale these institutions, because the issue is just with the cost of regulation, they need to be bigger, a lot sub million. So while we pushed on that effort, you got to go back to the exact, you know, that first issue. What is the first source? Friends and family, that's equity capital. So simultaneously, we were doing a whole bunch of research identifying well, if you've got $69 trillion of assets under management, less than 1.4 of it is managed by women and people of color, yeah. that starts to paint a picture with regards to how diverse the deployment of that capital is. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to solve that problem simultaneously. Got it. That set the, the groundwork for my exit out of the Milken Institute into Trident. Into Trident where you are focused on actively investing in, in this? So Trident is a minority owned control oriented buyout private equity. Okay. Where the approach is a little bit different than mm -hmm. the rest of the marketplace. The rest of the marketplace. Um, so, you know, taking a step back, as everybody knows, when you're investing equity, whether it's at seed venture growth equity in the buyout landscape, the industry has evolved to essentially focusing on writing bigger and bigger checks. Yeah. It's the exact same level of effort to write a $200 million check as it is a $1 million check when you're doing your diligence. And you want to increase your assets under management. From the fees perspective, as in itself, its own business. Mm -hmm. um, what that has resulted is essentially the vast majority of the small business in this country really have a hard time of getting that equity investment. We already know small businesses in this country account for two thirds of job growth. Yep. It's a lot. It's basically the main driver of wealth creation in this Absolutely. country. And so if you're missing, essentially putting that firepower to create wealth for the majority of this country, that's where you're going to get yeah. inequities. Wow. So this is, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, no uh, just to answer your question. So Trident's focus is on true small businesses, mm -hmm. essentially um, identify sub hundred million in revenue um, by SBA definition, anything under 500 employees is considered a small business, but we go a little bit smaller than that. Yeah. And we find that that's where a lot of other players are not there. Mm -hmm. That's one focus. Well, the second focus is a big part of the lesson and I'll draw a lesson from the banking area as banks started getting bigger past the global financial crisis uh, to deal with compliance costs, exact same problem, writing a big loan is the same amount of effort as a small loan. So they stopped providing yeah. uh, a lot of the lending in, uh, in smaller communities. Now, who's in the smaller communities? We started to see effectively a lot of the non-banks, the FinTech mm -hmm. step in leveraging technology being able to do underwriting in Very a way true. that was faster. Yeah. In the private equity universe, that evolution has not happened yet. Okay, okay. Uh, really interesting. Now I guarantee you with the latest round of SEC guidance with regards to disclosure and other elements, you're gonna see a lot more of that happen. Yeah. But in terms of a focus on technology to make the underwriting process more effective, Mm -hmm. That's novel still. And that's where so, Trident has been focusing. Essentially, um, instead of what others do, which is underwrite a business, our focus is underwrite people. Yes. Everyone says people matter in any organization. That's the heart of it. I can tell you within small businesses, they matter even more. And so our approach is around actually having as many independent sponsors slash operating partners uh, send us their information. And we've got a proprietary algorithm that's called SPEAR, Sponsor Evaluation and Rating, that basically rates them. Effectively, similar to you walk into a bank and everybody knowing your credit score before they do the full lift as that first screen, in a similar vein, it's SPEAR like allows us- potential score. 
that's exactly what it is. Yeah. Right? With 10 different heuristics, everything from your relevance to that particular thesis, to your years of uh, experience, your yeah. pedigree, all of these different elements kind of wrapped up a 50 point metric. Anything that's 30 and above invites the, a team to actually look at that transaction. I see. What that has allowed us to do is actually build a database where ever since we started collecting the racial demographic of that cohort group, we've actually over indexed in terms of what proportion are minority than the national percentage. Okay. And the distribution is actually quite accurate, whether you're a minority or not. So we have a good sample set, it's more than 600. That becomes yeah. a way to make sure that you have the right people identifying transactions or also part of the C-suite after the fact, which is a critical way of how we're engaging. So it's not necessarily, you know, here's a finder's fee and go away. Mm -hmm. And then the third and final element of it is, uh, it's not so much about who and what you invest in, it's what you do with it after the fact that's really powerful. In most cases, in a buyout landscape, you're doing something. You're investing in the human talent, you're refining its back office. How you do that is a place where someone who has essentially a social good mission attached, where you can really move the needle. So if you're gonna invest in the human capacity of an organization and you recognize there's not enough gender diversity, I can tell you empirically speaking, adding a woman to the C-suite of the board in an organization leads to financial performance, mm -hmm. we'll do that. Absolutely. If they need to optimize their supply chain, well, most procurement officers deal with those that they know. This is really, really interesting. It really resonates as well with things we, we've seen in research, for example. I mean, we've seen that, for example, with PPP, we watched, which was, a, which was this, this loan for small businesses, right? Uh, the, there was a lot less of, a, of an, it was a lot less kind of more blanket financing in that, eventually allowed um, a lot of more black businesses to get a lot more financing compared to uh, the usual day-to-day -day bank relationship lending whereas just as you're as you're saying they're very kind of not having these relationships and getting and getting big gaps we also saw for example when the cares act came in and gave these stimulus checks we saw higher entrepreneurship in 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 black neighborhoods presumably also because there's like bigger financial needed sort of consistent with what you're saying the financial kind of support can give an extra an extra boost i think it's i also think it's it's really amazing the way you're you're thinking about I, mean, I, I do want to jump in on your point on the ppp part because that was the learning yeah. not necessarily the finding during and i say that because um uh you know during the global financial crisis yeah uh for all extents and purposes the banks were uh the problem in right. PPP, they were used as part of the solution. So the federal government recognizing that the fastest way to get to businesses was to go through their banking relationships. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a large amount of the consolidated financial institutions had faster access to the Fed window, to PPP capabilities, and they, and they in a similar vein, went to their largest customers, which are not necessarily Clearly, Initially minority. quite inequality, absolutely. And it took time for the yeah. system to, to learn a little bit better. It Very took true. quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. And we had to do, and there was a group, of, a large group of stakeholders that were advocating for the federal government to actually put special rules in play for small community banks, minority CDFI and the like credit unions to be able to access yeah. PPP on a faster clip. Because even though you were not going to distribute more dollars, the the free, the the quantity of businesses that were going to be assisted was actually going to be greater, and that's where underserved actually played. And the fintechs so, played a big role in shaping change. Yeah, the that, fintechs right? absolutely so, played a big role. The community banks finally stepped up in in a, in a way in getting access, but that was the learning at the end. But that the mm. the, the the initial findings yeah. were actually how underbanked yeah. uh, minority wow. and small businesses were. And it took a lot to actually get PPP to actually do what its original intent is. Sorry, Dale. That's, no, off. that's really, really interesting. I mean, I think, are we doing, we're probably, I, oh, this is, so uh, we'll soon move, have to move to Q&A. But I think that, that I mean, I, I, I'd like several things about that. First, that it really got access to our minorities. But the way you're describing the, the, the initial finding and then how you fix the system and then how you, 
by working with government and, and supporting that, you and other stakeholders eventually were able to get more credit. It's sort of like really connecting the, the, the idea to the reality of actually giving these small business owners a lot more financing. And so it's very, very inspiring. Um, I also think, I mean, I, I, I think the way, the way you're using technology is something we talk a lot about here in business school, right? It's like, you know, you have to, the opportunities created by these technologies uh, and the way they, they allow you to focus on an on-tap market need, uh, because essentially, you know, we say here in business schools that using something like technology, um, it, really, it really sort of allows you to carve a distinct niche from kind of the, 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 the incumbents and kind of grow from there. And I, it seems to me the way you're doing it at Trident is, is sort of very consistent with that, right? It's really thanks to these, it's not only the fact that you had a, a vision uh, of inclusiveness and, and supporting small businesses that are minority, but that also supported with like sort of investments in a different way of doing it that, that in this case worked more with technology in a new way and kind of machine learning and data science and all that. A hundred percent. It's uh, it, that technology plus this uh, kind of construct is all about just intentionality and, yeah. and just understanding where the opportunity set is. So we're not an impact fund by any means, yeah, yeah. but technology allows us to, uh, identify kind of where others aren't going. And the mm -hmm. net result is actually there's more equity that's pushed yeah. out. Uh, a recognition that racial and economic injustice has left, and this is, you know, City did the study, McKinsey and others, mm -hmm. Milken did the study. We've left one to 1 1.6 trillion of economic productivity on the table wow. due to an, an, an inability of the private markets to tap African Americans in particular. Yeah. The number is triple that when you add in a Hispanic as well in okay. this country. But so if you do it the right way, that means you actually capture some of that as latent alpha for your investors while the follow on effect is actually inclusive economy yeah. for that community. That's and amazing. so that becomes a critical part of how we look at the, how we engage after the fact, enough so that we can actually take a step forward and say, hey, if we've done this the right way, there is some wealth that's being uh, yeah. accrued back to minority communities. And actually we've made a pledge mm -hmm. and said that, look, um, whether it's supply chain diversity or parking portfolio company capital in black owned banks, we see the multiplier effect of that actually at least being 13% of the value we create. And what I mean is with African-Americans at 13% of this country, we wanna make sure the, mis the misalignment that was shown in 2020 between representation and resource, we're actually closing the racial wealth gap. And right now I'm happy to say we're actually over-indexing on that in terms of jobs, wealth, representation. And we published a report that shows, here's how you do well while doing good in our sector. That is really that is really inspiring. I'm sure all students agree. That that sounds really powerful. I we probably need to open it up to questions, uh, but before we do that, I do. Um, I, I I am just curious, uh, just to inspire the students. Do you, do you have any other big thoughts we missed to ask you? Something about you want to tell them about where where it's all going or big trends that they have to be thinking about? Well, I guess the. Perhaps one thing to, um, because I, I'm a bit, I like to go into the details. I would say you'll be surprised the thing that you're trying to address and solve um, usually can be done with kind of 20% of the effort and not necessarily 100%. So that 80-20 rule with regards to your effort, spend that time to find what that is. And that can actually help unlock a lot more. Uh, don't let the, um, you know, essentially good be the enemy of, or perfect be the enemy of the good. It, 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 in everything that I have done, whether it was a recognition for, you know, the guarantee fund that I had that I needed to solve the, the credit treatment of guarantees on the banking sector and who are the different stakeholders, and that would change the landscape. Or a recognition that here is tier one capital injection into minority depository institutions that create scale. And Treasury now is implementing a $9 billion set of investments in mission-focused banks. That's gonna create probably one of the largest influxes of capital out there. And you'll see a lot of the empirical evidence behind that was stuff that we did at, at, right. at Milken. For now, what I'm focusing on with Trident, 
a recognition of linking profit and purpose that it's not misaligned. That 20% leads to the 100. You say, well, you won't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But from this vantage point, that sounds pretty amazing. So, um, all right, so let's open it up for questions. Uh, I don't know, from here from the audience, if, if you guys here have any questions or remote, um, I think that, you know, here they have one question. Do you mind holding the mic so, oh, so they sure. can hear you remote? Thank you so much. And say your name Hello. and who you are as well, so we can all kind of keep that in mind. Sure, I'm Anna K. Barrett. Um, I am a second year here at Columbia Business School, focusing on real estate, private equity. So you touched on, and thank you so much for being here. I've taken so many notes. <laughs> um, you've touched on how in the past you have experiences where you had to address the policy gaps. I'm curious to know, now you're in the space working with Trident, you've seen, you know, maybe some things that are coming against you, um, some policies that you could probably do better not being there. Um, is there anything right now that you'd like to change in terms of policies that you think would make your efforts to give back to you know these communities and, and help them grow and actually see your returns go further, um, make it more easily attainable? Uh, policy gaps in its own right is like a multi-hour session, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll sell you something that has recently been done that actually will um, improve. It, and that is essentially uh, a big chunk of the financial investments that the banking sector uh, used to provide was barred by certain kind of overstatements of the vocal rule with regards to how banks can play in equity investing and using their balance sheet. I think there's a difference between kind of, uh, I would say a little bit more risk taking that what we saw during the global financial crisis versus equity investments in small businesses in their backyard. Fortunately, uh, there's been some restatements with regards to exemptions to the VOCA rule, um, specifically around kind of how uh, public welfare investments could be made and how that actually ends up allowing the banking sector to provide that equity type investments. So that was something that was just kind of clarified very recently. And I actually think that's gonna be a good thing because from the banking um, community banks, minority owned banks, CDFI banks like, can take advantage of that. They're filling that part of the capital stack that's missing. And because if you don't have enough of the well equitized small businesses in their backyard, you either add over leverage and get these businesses into problems, or they send that capital to, for the lack of a better word, you know, Beverly Hills doing condos rather than truly catalyzing growth. And so that's one in particular. And I can, we can go into a long range group of other things on the policy front, but the, the big takeaway is um, don't think that you can, that you have to take those policy gaps as a given. There is a process to basically inform policymakers and actually get them to understand and change. If we if that had not been the, the truth, a lot of things that have been achieved in the past couple of decades would not have been possible. So lean in if you need to to change policy. Could I add one more in there? I, I mean, it's, it's you mentioned this 20% rule, and now you, you mentioned sort of a lot of change, achieving a lot of change. And so so I, I would take that you need to rely on a lot of people, you know, it's part of sort of a leader and kind of work with a lot of people to get this done. How do you choose, you know, part, sort of a leadership lesson for us and for the students? How do you choose who to work with or how do, how, you know, how do you find those lever points to make your time successful when you're trying to create social change or change policy or things like that? Uh, internal and external. Okay. Externally, be totally comfortable with the precept that you're not going to have all of the answers. and feel comfortable in asking those who you actually disagree with why they disagree with each other. And so there's a range of different strategic partners slash thought partners externally that we engage with at Trident. And I've, that's been my MO for throughout my professional career. And so I, I think it's really, really important. And sometimes you find out the, the disagreement is actually a non-issue or can be addressed rather quickly. Internally within Trident, we're constantly hungry for new talent. So anyone from Columbia Business School that's looking for an internship in, the, in anything that I've talked about, please reach out to me. Uh, 
and the, 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 uh, the precept ends up being, um, you always want to surround yourself with folks that are smarter than you. Um, uh, and, I, and I so appreciate uh, a lesson that was taught to me here at Columbia Business School one of the, when someone said, well, why wouldn't you want to hire only people smarter than you? Because if you were the smartest person in the room, you've maxed out your capability. I want to make, make sure that those that join, whether they be analysts, associates, and otherwise, are actually both contributing to our mission, but also we'll be challenging them to, to grow. Uh, and and for, for us, that becomes our greatest asset, the people that we have and being able to reach the mission, both whether it be commercial or social. That's really wonderful. And we've, I learn a lot from students every day in each, in each case discussion. Um, I really like that this, that you mentioned, we'll listen to the other side and ask why, rather that it really changes your mindset from thinking, well, we're going to fight to, we're going to find that common ground and try to, and try to see how we can collaborate. And assuming there's no kind of adversarial reason there under. Next question. Do we, do we have somebody, we have somebody remote? From online. Uh, Aaron, you've had so many successes in your career. Can you please share a failure that you have learned from and in hindsight was instrumental in your growth? I, I was going to say, thank you for saying everything I've done has been a success because I would say every single one of them had a huge failure embedded into it. It was just a recognition, something I tell my two kids, uh, Alex and Helena, who are, might be watching, is uh, what I always ask them, what is failure? And finally, they've learned to say, oh, it's practice until you succeed. And so uh, when we were able for the first time ever, uh, uh, when I was a CEO for Financing for Development and, and Pledge Guarantee for Health to get receivables financing on donor-funded pledges, there were a lot of failures in every single one of them, people recognizing what we were trying to do. In today's role within Trident, uh, Every single time we have an advancement, it's standing on the shoulders of a lot of learnings, a lot of failures in convincing stakeholders. Actually, when we are investing in these types of businesses, 100% of the deals that Trident has done are public welfare investments. And I can tell you under the regulatory definition that automatically triggers to investors, oh, you're concessional, you're below market, you're, you're not necessarily a place that I can uh, invest out of my big pocket. You're the one that gets it out of the small change pocket in the jeans. No, the only reason why uh, those investments end up being PWI is because of a, a, essentially a focus on, well, most PE firms, they'll tell you the biggest drivers of their returns is vintage and price, essentially the price that you paid at the beginning and the vintage year of the investments of the market cycle that you were a part of. And on that pricing component, uh, we have a focus of you know, four to six times enterprise value uh, uh, EV to EBITDA that we're focusing on. So it's a, essentially good businesses at low price point. But that means that that low pricing is you're not necessarily in communities that are with physical assets in Beverly Hills or on Fifth Avenue. You're in LMI neighborhoods. That doesn't mean a business that essentially meet, uh, has a whole bunch of PhDs as part of their labor force. It means middle of America, uh, middle income people are working there. And so we backed into a fact that we're actually playing where the heartland of this country is because that is commercially the right thing to do. And so every single one of these conversations were part of the learning, explaining to people where essentially, you know, saying, hey, this is what you're doing. No, that's that triggered a failure in other people's mind that we constantly had to educate, constantly had to educate. And so I, I say, um, you know, failure is just nothing but uh, practice until you succeed. Can I add one there? This is, this was, this was really interesting. It made me think about the, what you were saying earlier about your active role in supporting these businesses. Once you go in, what is it, you know, when you go into these communities, what is, what are the biggest gaps that you see entrepreneurs um, needing, what are the biggest things that you think uh, these businesses need that you guys are able to bring um, um, kind of to support them and help them grow? Access to capital, access to opportunities. Those are the two biggest drivers. Okay. So sales and partnerships as well. And 100%. Just, okay. 100%. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, right. have a, I have a question. Um, and first, I just 
I want to say I feel a great deal of pride because I've known Aaron for a long time. Um, I remember him as a prospective student years ago and hearing a story, but just being inspired by your personal story, what you did for your brother and all that kind of stuff after his passing and all that kind of stuff. But um, so I hope you share some, some of that because I, I think that's an important part of like knowing who you are. But then also in terms of Trident, you spoke about the model that you have. Um, can you share a bit more about the findings in terms of are there particular sectors that you're, you're finding more opportunities uh, or not? Um, well, in terms of particular sectors, Trident focuses on consumer healthcare and industrials, uh, largely because it's a mixture of both. That's where we see the marketplace having some interesting areas, but also the experience of the investment team that we have. And, you know, it, it also lends itself to this idea of kind of price and vintage uh, because we're trying to make sure we find good businesses that are essentially undervalued, you know, in healthcare, that doesn't mean you're going to be looking at healthcare technology. The multiples on that are kind of insane. Uh, that doesn't mean branded consumer. Uh, it means you know, a bunch of other things. So healthcare services and non-branded uh, consumer products, consumer durables. And so it, essentially you, you end up into segments of the marketplace that really make sense from a commercial thesis to, to engage. And frankly, those are also the areas where a lot of dis uh, essentially underserved communities are participants. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if, if we want to talk about, and so in, in the previous session, I think you had a conversation about the great resignation. Uh, you want to flip that on its head and actually say, well, a lot of underserved communities, a lot of uh, stakeholders that have not been as participating in the rising tide of this country, should they be seeing that as kind of a red flag or should, they, should we actually flip it on its head and say, is this a great opportunity for stakeholders to actually think about um, their own, taking ownership of their own career going forward? So 12,000 small businesses change hands every year. And who works in a lot of these? Essentially, you know, whether it's somebody that has worked for you know, 20 years running car dealerships, he probably knows where the nearest roll-up opportunity of John Deere dealerships are. That stakeholder that has now quit his job, he should be thinking about being put in a position to acquire, take ownership of one of those small and medium enterprises in their backyard. And essentially, that's what we recently, my uh, Eric Taylor, one of, uh, CEO and uh, CIO for Trident, penned an op-ed saying, this is a great opportunity. This is essentially this new stakeholders of experienced operators that are now looking for their next chapter. We need to provide them the capital, the opportunities and the capital to buy some of these businesses that are now trying to change hands. And they're accelerating in terms of that because we're also seeing the potential for uh, capital gains taxes to increase. That means a lot of those family run enterprises that probably would have been sold in the next three to five years are thinking about selling now. And so it's a unique opportunity of experienced stakeholders thinking about their next chapter and perhaps being given the resources to be owners of their next chapter. So to me, that's where we find a huge amount of excitement because that essentially is the building block of kind of equitable access to the American dream. Could I, could I push in that? What about geography? Do you, where do you, where you mentioned about this gap between, you know, the, those people where, where there's a lot of opportunity for investment, et cetera. Do you see that those opportunities more in places like the city in Harlem or more West Virginia? I don't know. Like where, how, how do you, what, what's your impression on that? Well, I, I, I would say there's opportunity kind of in all 50 states plus. Uh, I mean, we recently acquired a building materials company in Hertzel, Alabama. And yeah. so this is like 30 miles outside of Huntsville. so a really small town. Uh, but we also have assets in, you know, Texas as well as in uh, New Jersey uh, and one in New England as well. And so the, as well as uh, a business in Salt Lake City. Uh, okay. So I think there are opportunities everywhere. You're not going to find perhaps another uh, Fortune 500 company situated 
outside of kind of key areas. Mm -hmm. But in terms of small businesses that are the backbone of this country, you're going to find them everywhere. Nice. And what else you're going to find is the knowledgeable operators are also in those tier two, tier three cities across okay. the country. It's, that becomes a reason why we ended up changing the model of find those individuals irrespective of where they are and allow empower them with the, with the knowledge that sourcing that opportunity in their backyard, they're better place than some guy coming from New York City with my city slicker suit, being able to tell them, hey, this is, what, why, uh, this is valuable. No, you're empowered to actually identify and then be part of that C-suite leadership mm -hmm. to transition that growth after the fact. It's really that, that personal investment that they put in their communities. It's how do you kept, they're able to capitalize that rather than Absolutely. us coming in. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Okay, remote. Speaking of local communities, and when you think about Columbia Business School's new move to our Manhattanville campus, what do you think uh, Columbia Business School can do now that we're here in this local new local community? And what can we do that would be the most impactful, not only to this community here, but even to New York City as a whole, as you think about students who are graduating and going into these leadership roles in a lot of these Fortune 500 companies? Uh, I would say, you know, learning by doing is mm -hmm. kind of a, a helpful tactic here. And that is, I absolutely love the way this building looks. I wish it was here when I was here. Uh, but the fact that, you know, it was thoughtful in terms of putting this green space that is open to the community, wonderful. But I would say the school, the business school itself, uh, spends quite a bit of money. And if there are ways of making sure that some of those assets are in and around uh, empowering local stakeholders in the Upper West Side, would behoove the school in terms of what it's trying to really do kind of uh, for the community, but also becomes an education tool for the students themselves. That there is nothing wrong with thinking about, well, whether it's, you know, food contracts, the custodial contracts, the construction work, whatever is done, is spent essentially with businesses that are in its backyard, the catering capabilities, all of those different elements. Because then the community feels that it's not that uh, Columbia Business School or Columbia University itself is just a, you know, a neighbor. It's essentially, they, they are, it's part of them. They are owners and participants in its success. Uh, that level of inclusivity is going to be a great lesson for students as they go on to their next chapter to think about, well, okay, as I maximize my returns, how do I actually bring up other individuals? I completely reject the notion that those two are uh, opposing thoughts. Uh, we've seen that play out in the past couple of decades when you essentially have a complete misunderstanding between stakeholder and shareholder rights. I applaud the business roundtable that came, you know, took a step forward and say, no, it's not just about maximizing shareholder profits. We need to look at all stakeholders. And I, I, I say the evidence is going to come out more and more now that the more your local stakeholders also benefit, essentially you will too, shareholders. That's a really really, really um, strong thesis that Columbia has also been taking very seriously as part of here, actually that Tamar Center is really engaged with the community. We have a, a community development plan that includes a lot more than, than, as you mentioned, just the green space is not enough. Just the, the people that, that, that are able to kind of have their small businesses here as well as other things, hoping to actually some of that connection. I like what you mentioned about the fact that the values that people take here, they go and use them throughout their career because it's a really strong call uh, to everybody, right, in the community. It's like a strong call to us as professors to make sure we do that and teach the right values. And it's a strong call to students to make sure they, they embody those because they affect themselves and part of their classmates. So I think it's really amazing. Um, we have a next question over there. And remember, please, to introduce yourself and, and, and then ask your question. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Silvia Andrade. Uh, I'm part of the Sustainability Management Program here at Columbia University. Thank you so much for sharing with us your experiences. And my question is, um, when we are talking about minorities, it is considered that, and we were talking about opportunities and gap 
it is considered that minorities don't have access to education or to the same quality of education that other communities have. So, and when I'm talking about education, I'm talking about specifically financial education. So um, I would like to know if you have like any kind of initiatives in order to improve financial education in these uh, communities, talking about specifically minorities, in order to have like the right use or the most efficient use of the funding that they are uh, getting from this initiative that we have. Thank you. Well, um, yes, there is a lot that's being written up essentially at the disconnect of financial literacy, financial education that's necessary. But I actually think that is a phenomenon for the entire country. Uh, it, I think financial education needs to be implemented at kind of the you know, pre-secondary school, elementary level uh, in across every uh, part of this country, not just in minority corridors. When you get to a certain level um, of, especially on the Trident side, um, I actually reject the notion that the sponsors we're talking to are not capable. Uh, it, you know, I, I go back to the example of what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. There are a, an equal distribution of those that rate super high on our database that are minority versus the ones that are not. And so I guess it depends on what the opportunity that we're talking about. So whether you're talking about kind of single proprietor uh, entrepreneurial activities or the, the small businesses that we're investing in, which is obviously a little bit more sophisticated, but your point on in terms of the gap of knowledge with regards to financial literacy in this country, it's uniform. I would say we need to see that as early as possible in every school. And I think there's now more and more state governments that are trying to implement it. You know, one other thing that I wanna make a point on is uh, even though as part of our social mission is a recognition of kind of racial uh, wealth uh, inequality, I don't think it should be put on the responsibility of minorities themselves to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. So in the African-American population at 13%, uh, that is ridiculous to presume to invest there is the only way to serve the African-American population. Essentially, the other 87% needs to play a part. And so we don't actually exclusively engage in minority-owned businesses. No, it's all businesses. And so uh, saying that we have, if it's a white-owned Wisconsin cheese factory, um, if there is a, a value to be made in post-investment value creation that is commercially sound, we'll invest in it, but we'll bring along with it in terms of if there's human capacity investments, we'll make it more diverse. If there's supply chain diversity, we'll do that. We will do all these things because they make commercial sense. That's a big part of the education that I was mentioning earlier that I think there's been too much of a, a segregation of these different points. I think the more inclusive we try to make commercial enterprises, and make sure that everybody's actually making uh, a, a commercial return. Uh, as our investors make more money, I can then assure that the social outcomes in the communities we target will actually also improve. That's awesome. We probably have a chance for one more question, but I wanna take my, my moderator privilege to add, a, to add a quick question to Sandra's point, which was, you, know, you said you, you have these peer algorithm, 50 point metric measuring, measuring, and. And at the same time, I'm thinking about this education and, and I'm thinking, well, a biased algorithm would look, for example, at the, the type of degrees you have and the type of, you come from the right universities, et cetera. So you almost kind of need a, sep a different type of algorithm that is more, how do you, what kind of things do you look for when you measure these, these uh, entrepreneurs and their, their kind of potential uh, in your index? Well, I will say that um, two things, one, I think there is a huge amount of learnings in terms of leveraging algorithms to make decisions. From our perspective, our algorithm is more about filtering, not necessarily what you invest in, getting the sense of what you don't want to focus on. I see. So it's a slightly different element. The, the, the second thing is um, our, our approach is you need to be dynamic. 
and actually make okay. sure you add more and refine over time. And so actually diversity is one of the heuristics that's embedded in mm. the algorithm. So essentially all things being equal, if you're a diverse sponsor, you'll move through the system faster. Right. And so what it's allowed us to do is then look at, well, is our process working? And so I'd mentioned earlier, so we over-index for the population that's minority in there, but then we have a normal distribution with regards to how many of them are actually high rated versus low rated that matches the non-diverse group of investors, okay. a non-diverse group of independent sponsors, operating yeah. partners that we engage in. So that tells us our approach so far yeah. is working, that it's not skewed and biased to that. By all means, um, as more and more folks wake up to their potential of actually, I am an operating partner. I could be in a position to buy a business. As more folks wake up to saying I should be part of that that cohort group, let's see what what the what the landscape yeah. says. But thus far, I feel pretty good about our ability that we've weeded out inherent bias in our system. That's really, really, really interesting. Just kind of the, the future of technology shaping investment. Do we want to do the last question, Diana? Uh, and then I um, looks like we're running out of time. Really uh, yeah. disheartened because we're really we're, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Go ahead. So, Aaron, when you think about your role at Trident and tri what Trident's doing and their, their mission as a whole, what's the most difficult part? Is it finding the investment opportunities, being able to do proper due diligence, finding talent in your organization, or is it something else? Uh, I would say all of the things that you just mentioned are um, obtainable uh, with effort. The, the hardest thing is getting investors comfortable with the idea that just because I care about the communities we're in, just because I care about the employees, just because I care about the environment, uh, that don't think that I'm not going to be as, uh, as much of a naked capitalist as possible, that we will make you money. They, they fear that essentially profit and purpose is counter. Uh, but what we're trying to do is educate stakeholders that no, they, that does not have to be the case. And so that's gonna be a learning lesson for more and more stakeholders. The how you engage really matters. When you need to make a decision really quick and who you hire the lawyer in this, slow things down and be thoughtful about how you engage with different stakeholders. That's when you can actually make a, a really big social outcome change, is engage with different set of stakeholders, be thoughtful about the vendors you're using, be thoughtful about the valuations that you're engaging in, the markets that you're playing in. And if you do that, profit and purpose is not at odds. So convincing investors, that's probably the hardest thing, but thus far we've been pretty good. That is really an amazing closing point. I really learned so much today and I hope everybody here it was really an outstanding um, conversation with Aaron. I mean, some points that I really take, I, I really like this, it's the closing sentence, profit and purpose are not, um, are, are not in juxtaposition. And it's easy to say, but it's, it, because we've, we have said it, but it's really quite different to see it embodied in your philosophy, in your work and trying to work through those challenges. It really makes, it's really inspiring, I think, to all of us, um, also, but also the way you as a person and your identity and the way you're using technology and ultimately, um, you know, finding opportunity in ways that, that, are, that are really creating social change and also creating a great business. It's really outstanding. And it's really kind of, I think, lands the topic of the conversation today in the conference, which is Capital for Good at Columbia Business School. So Aaron, I cannot thank you uh, enough for being here. This is really nice. And we hope to have you at Columbia uh, very often. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.